Good morning. Uh, I'm Arvind Weinbaum, Director of Middle East Institute's Afghanistan and Pakistan Studies. I'll be moderating a panel this morning that will examine several dimensions of the coronavirus health crisis in Pakistan and Afghanistan, including their social, economic, and political impact. As we'll see, although there are many ways in which Pakistan and Afghanistan differ in the threats they face and the responses, there is much that they have in common. Both countries have reported over recent weeks steady growth of coronavirus cases, figures that probably because of limited testing grossly underestimate the spread of the disease. Many of the initial infections in Pakistan and Afghanistan are traceable above all to Iran, carried back by religious pilgrims and returning unemployed. The two countries are also similar in their high vulnerability. Neither has anything like the necessary protective gear, testing facilities, medical equipment needed to cope with a rapid growth of infections. Countries are alike in finding that quarantining is difficult to enforce. With much of the pressure against mandated social distancing, coming from religious groups. Both Pakistan and, and Afghanistan are financially strapped, dependent on strong external assistance to deal with the healthcare crisis. Certainly one of this magnitude. This at a time when general US funding to both countries has dropped. The dilemma facing authorities globally, how to weigh health demands against economic ones particularly salient in Pakistan and Afghanistan. The two countries join with other less developed countries where the failure to meet either, either health or economic demands can have a catastrophic impact on the well-being of their populations. We begin with a brief presentation by each of the panelists. And uh, at the moment, uh, Haskar, uh, uh, Askari Rizvi has not joined us. We hope he will be able to do Ray shortly. Following on these presentations, I may ask a question or two and encourage dialogue among the panelists. We will then entertain questions posted by viewers using Zoom's Q&A feature, which you can find on your screens. For those calling in or phoning or watching the panel, on live stream, MEI live stream, you can ask a question on Twitter uh, with the hashtag MEI events or through email events at MEI.edu. If you have any technical difficulties, that email, a simple email address will work as well. So let me introduce the first of our panelists. I'd like to welcome Natasha Anwar. Natasha is a molecular pathologist at Aga Khan University Hospital Regional Lab in Lahore. Natasha, please. And Good welcome, morning. Oscar Rizvi, by the way. Oh, he's here, yay. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Marvin, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning with all the panelists. Um, and I hope I can add some uh, insight into really what's happening in Pakistan as of today. So all the, all the data that I'm going to share with you is, uh, you know, is very real-time data as, um, as of this morning. So I'm going to quickly share my slides. Okay, start off. So here's, um, is it going to work? Yes, great, okay. So here's the story so far of COVID-19 in Pakistan. Um, well, we started off um, fairly, fairly slowly um, compared to other countries. Um, on the 12th of February, um, Pakistan launched a national action plan um, in its attempt to prepare for um, any uh, pandemic situation. Um, this was actually really 
quite in, um, uh, well orchestrated, timely disseminated across all provinces. Um, and in fact, um, so timely that a week later, around about the 22nd of February, when we closed the borders against Iran, we saw our first case reported in Karachi on the 26th of February. Um, following on from that, the borders were opened again um, uh, around about the 7th of March for pilgrims returning, just because there were so many pilgrims that had gone um, across to Iran. They wanted to return. They wanted to come back to Pakistan. By then, quarantine facilities had been set up. So you can see up until the 7th of March, with case notifications were still fairly, fairly low. Um, and that continued all the way um, until the 23rd of 22nd, 23rd of March, where we start to see an increase. Um, and we actually suspended international flights around about this time. Um, and the national lockdown actually started uh, just 24th uh, of March, a few days later. So what we can see is from the 24th onwards, we had a very linear um, sort of logarithmic increase in case notifications. And these are all positive case notifications. Um, and uh, on the 13th, 14th of April, uh, the lockdown was relaxed in Punjab. Uh, the government actually started to think about uh, the possibility of smart lockdowns. And that uh, basically means that where you have hotspots of cases, you basically close that area down completely and you stop people coming in and out of that area. Um, and they really want, wanted to emphasize on test, track, and quarantine approach to trying to manage this rather than going for a, a continued national lockdown. Um, I can't see the end of, I'm going to try and just move this, yeah, okay, I can move this across. Um, up until um, uh, now when Ramadan started a few, a few days back, about four or five days back, uh, the line in orange is really our death rate um, compared to the number of cases. Um, so our total cases as of this morning were around about 15 and a half thousand and the number of deaths are 343. Um, so moving on from that, um, when, if we just take a look at the breakdown of cases um, province wise, uh, again, you know, there are interesting trends. Um, but what I've done is that um, you, you, know, you can see the lines going up uh, from each province. The purple is Punjab, Sindh is blue. Um, some of our other provinces uh, that aren't so well equipped, um, uh, KPK, Balochistan, um, Azad, Jammu, Kashmir. Um, and at the bottom, what I've done is that I've put a table together of how um, the provinces have been prepared in terms of, so that lag time of about five to six weeks before we started to see our cases uh, come through um, and before we, we saw that linear increase in cases, it gave um, the government a chance to really try and um, sort of, you know, prepare and get the provinces ready for, um, for, for any more cases. So they, they essentially um, established core tertiary care COVID hospitals. Now these were already uh, hospitals that were already functioning, uh, but they were then designated as COVID hospitals. So they would only see COVID patients. Um, uh, a number of uh, isolation beds were actually identified in each province and total capacity in each province was, was identified. As well as that, they, um, they also implemented um, uh, and, and set up quarantine facilities. Now this was, um, uh, this, this was actually the, the sort of the, the largest quarantine facility um, over 10, uh, to, to be able to cope with about 10,000 people is in Punjab. And these are various locations scattered throughout the province um, you know, various hospitals, various hostels, various university uh, hostels that have been uh, taken over uh, as potential quarantine facilities. Um, at the same time, uh, they, allowed, they identified ventilators in public and private sector hospitals and did a count of that. Um, now, these now are being supplemented with additional ventilators that have been bought by the government. So these numbers probably have changed uh, recently. Um, and that, and in addition to that, the capacity to test for coronavirus, so that means the laboratories that can specifically perform PCR testing, that was also um, uh, enhanced in all the provinces. So in, uh, we started off early on, uh, sort of, you know, early March with about 10 labs that could do the PCR. 
to 57, uh, almost, uh, almost 60 now, that can actually perform the PCR test across Pakistan. And the capacity uh, to, per test is in, shown in brackets, and that's really enhanced tremendously as well. Um, and um, in the graph on the left, you can see how the testing is uh, being performed on a daily basis. Um, and the one in yellow is Sindh, actually. Sindh is actually doing the most amount of testing now as of the last two weeks. Their, their, their testing capacity per day has actually uh, almost doubled what it was uh, at the initial onset of the, uh, of the pandemic. Um, and on the right, something that, um, that is a really interesting, uh, oh, sorry, gone back a bit. Um, is, is another, uh, another sort of way to look at the, is, is to look at the results is, um, is to look at the test positive rate. So initially when the pandemic began, we had a very sort of, you know, high test positive rate. Um, and that seems to have settled down over the last sort of um, four, to five, uh, four to five weeks. And we think this is because initially uh, we had a higher, uh, we were sort of doing focus testing in the, in the, in the quarantined people who were coming over from, uh, from Iran. Um, and uh, so that's why we had these clusters of positive cases coming up higher than we would normally. That seems to have settled down. So this is, so initially we were looking at um, clusters of cases and further, later on now we're looking at community transmission. Um, <clears throat> How, um, how is the disease distributed across different age groups? Um, well, this is a really nice um, graph that the COVID dashboard um, puts up every day on a daily basis. So again, you know, it's almost 70% of uh, the positive cases are, are in the age group 20 to, to 59. And again, mostly our younger um, and younger male adults seem to be the ones who are most frequently uh, turning out positive. Um, and the death rate, again, the, you know, that seems to have a totally different demographic. Uh, we've gotten the majority of our cases over 60 years of age. Um, so if we just think about in terms of, you know, silver linings, I mean, um, it's really important to think about some good things that have come out of this. Um, and that's that the National Action Plan was formulated timely and it was implemented. There were um, an, an, you know, an endless number of SOPs that were developed and this is the first time we've seen something like this really happen uh, here, here in Pakistan. Um, and that enabled a real strengthening of the public health systems, uh, including reaching out to the private sector and asking for their input and their expertise and availability of beds and ventilators, et cetera. Um, the public health awareness campaigns have been pretty tremendous. Uh, not only have they been running on the television, but on telephones um, and on SMS messages and things. Um, there are some gaps uh, in the public uh, um, awareness campaigns. The gaps are uh, really about informing the public about what happens once they test positive. Uh, what is the, what's the procedure for tracking uh, identifying them and then taking them off to a quarantine facility or letting them self-isolate at home. So that, um, that in, you know, that's still something that's not very clear to a lot of people and that's causing some concern and some anxiety uh, and fear of being tested. Um, online dashboards that have been developed by each province, again, this really sort of strengthened the, uh, the communication of, of data and results. Uh, in a real-time fashion, and that's enabled a better rapid response to the, you know, tracking and quarantine system that's been set up in each province. And all of this data is being fed into the central COVID dashboard that's available online. Um, the other thing that's been really good is that we've our various regulators that really uh, find it quite challenging sometimes to regulate in Pakistan. They've uh, they've done a they've done a great job. I mean, they've really turned around their rapid review and assessment processes and procedures. Uh, healthcare facilities looking after COVID patients are being assessed and audited. Uh, labs performing PCR tests, they've been given minimum standards and again, they're being assessed and audited. Um, DRAP, which is our drug uh, regulatory authority of Pakistan, that uh, again has sort of sprung into action and it's making sure that any drugs that are being tested for research, uh, for clinical trials, those are registered with DRAP. Uh, similarly, ethics review of projects, for, of research projects and clinical trials. Uh, again, we've, we've had these, uh, these, these sort of committees and things come in, come, you know, really sort of um, turn around their, their, their processing time. And that's been remarkable. There seems to be a renewed faith and trust uh, by the public in doctors. We've been struggling with that for many years in Pakistan. 
uh, because of the huge uh, shift to private medical care. Um, but but this, is, this has really been very heartening. Um, communities helping each other. There's a huge effort to help those in need and affected by the lockdown. We've seen this across the globe and Pakistan is no different. Um, this, but we still have areas of concern. Um, the biggest concern right now is that will the smart lockdowns be effective enough? Um, duty to self and duty to community. I think this is a theme that's coming up quite frequently now in terms of people who are tested positive. Um, sometimes they're very difficult to track. Sometimes they don't uh, provide correct information in terms of telephone number and addresses. Um, and that's actually proving a little difficult for the, for the tracking and quarantine process. Uh, provision of PPEs to frontline healthcare workers. Um, this is uh, an ongoing struggle uh, for us here in Pakistan as well. Uh, and it's not just for doctors and nurses, it's really for auxiliary staff as well and cleaning staff. Um, we haven't begun to measure the impact on other illnesses. Um, we've had our OPDs closed for a number of weeks. They are open now. But again, there is, uh, you know, there is concern about the impact of uh, of, of COVID-19 on other chronic illnesses in terms of access to healthcare. Getting back to work as people, as the lockdowns are being slowly relaxed, people are contemplating going back to work and that's creating another uh, sense of anxiety. Will it be safe? How are workspaces being prepared for people to come back? Uh, public health ethics in terms of pandemics, uh, in terms of quarantine, privacy, confidentiality issues, stigma issues, these again have been discussions that have been coming up on various platforms uh, here in, in Pakistan. Um, access to research on prevalence, transmission, treatments and vaccines. Uh, we will also need data from these studies to implement additional measures to control the pandemic. And at the moment, we, we haven't really put together um, a comprehensive research action plan uh, for, for Pakistan. But I do believe that there is a task force, a committee that was set up a few days back to look into these, in, into these areas. Um, I think globally, you know, all, all around the world, healthcare uh, providers, uh, doctors, researchers, epidemiologists, virologists, anyone related to healthcare, um, you know, we, we're, we're being asked to manage, uh, provide answers, provide so solutions, give hope to, to everybody. And it poses a huge amount of uh, responsibility and uh, and burden, and it's extremely tiring. So my last slide is just this beautiful drawing that was shared uh, by a student of ours. Um, and I uh, just wanted to sort of acknowledge everyone out there in healthcare who's really doing a tremendous job. Thank you very much, Martin. Natasha, thank you so much for uh, such a thorough overview of what has been going on with regard to the virus in Pakistan. Uh, as I as I look, I, I don't believe we, well, we may have lost uh, Ascari Rizvi. Uh, is that right? Perhaps so. In which case, uh, if we could now switch back to the main screen. Thank you. Uh, there's Ascari Rizvi. So <laughs> we haven't lost him at all. Ascari, uh, let me introduce you now uh, because I want you also uh, now to uh, give other dimensions of the effect of the coronavirus in Pakistan. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Hassan is a uh, professor emeritus, political science at Punjab University. Formerly, he was caretaker, chief minister of Punjab. And I should add also one of Pakistan's most recognizable, respected TV political commentators. So, Askari, the floor is yours. We just had a, an excellent overview of how Pakistan began its encounter uh, with the coronavirus um, and how it moved on to reach to the present situation in Pakistan. Now, let me interpret uh, all this uh, data in terms of state policies and also uh, how the state responded to these challenges and uh, problems over time, and what are the issues that the state of Pakistan will have to uh, take into account uh, for the future, that is learning from uh, the present experience that has been outlined to you. Now, one thing that has become very clear over the last two months is that there has been a lot of deficiency 
in the state-run public health care system in Pakistan. Initially, there were a serious problem of uh, shortage of uh, testing kits, medical uh, gowns, masks, even ventilators. And Pakistan uh, got some of these uh, products either from China as a gift or Pakistan purchased from different Chinese company and these were brought to Pakistan uh, to meet the immediate needs. Now, now situation seems to have improved um, over time as was explained in the earlier uh, presentation. Uh, the important thing to learn from this uh, experience of two months is uh, that you know the epidemics that cause uh, a uh, health crisis at the national level can be as threatening as the conventional issues of national uh, security. Therefore, an uh, epidemic like this is also a national uh, security um, issue uh, because uh, if you can't provide for human and societal uh, security, if the uh, nation faces health uh, problems or other problems, of course, then uh, there is a, a greater internal threat, a threat to internal uh, social order. And for that, I think uh, the lesson is that there will have to be a greater attention to healthcare, education, environment, and also what we realized from uh, the days of uh, um, lockdown and loosening of lockdown is the issue of uh, uh, population. That is how do you manage population uh, growth because that has also a policy implication. I think another lesson that uh, I think we have learned over uh, the last two months is that even if you apply a law equally to all people, lockdown was applied equally to all uh, people in Pakistan in the initial stages. However, its impact can be different on different sections of population. And that's what we have learned from lockdown because lockdown has more negative impact on the poor sections of population. That is the lower middle classes uh, to the poor and daily wage earners, they were hurt more than the rich people who were able to uh, face that. And uh, uh, then there were two important developments that needs to be recognized. That is the efforts that were made to help these disadvantaged sections of population. On the one hand, uh, the government had uh, uh, its plan and those plans are still going on. Government is providing some kind of financial or material support uh, to the um, uh, disadvantaged sections of, of the population. But I think another noteworthy fact is that societal response has been very positive. That is individuals and voluntary organizations have been quite actively working in different uh, you know, areas of Pakistan. Although we, we noted lack of coordination in these kinds of official efforts and non-official efforts. But nevertheless, there is a lot of you know, effort you know, uh, going on. Let me also mention uh, that this lockdown issue providing economic assistance or support is primarily an urban phenomena. In the rural areas, I think life goes on more or less as it is because this is the wheat cropping season in Pakistan and wheat cropping is going on uh, at full swing. The other uh, two issues which I want to mention quickly before I you know, conclude is the questions that relate to national economy. Without sound, uh, stable, um, enduring uh, national economy, you can't really do anything uh, for ensuring uh, quality health care and uh, you can't build that kind of a system and that has been uh, a problem here. In case of Pakistan, uh, uh, the, uh, the budget deficit and also trade imbalance was shrinking over the last one year. But now 
I don't think this can be sustained uh, by the Pakistani government. That is, trade imbalance, budget deficit is going to increase now. Otherwise, we were thinking that for the first time, perhaps Pakistan will get over most of the budget deficit, but it's not really possible. Another thing is that a lot of development fund, uh, which was for different development projects of the state, is now being diverted for fighting corona and providing relief uh, to the common people. Therefore, the key question that will have to be addressed today and tomorrow uh, is how would the economy recover in the post-corona period? And can Pakistan ensure physical discipline, efficiency, recovery of um, industry, and also export-oriented uh, output that will help to uh, you know, overcome the problem of the economy? And countries like Pakistan, that's my feeling, that countries like Pakistan that depend on external support, you know, for financial grants, uh, loans, uh, remittances of Pakistani workers uh, living outside, now they will find themselves more dependent on external sources. That's not the problem of Pakistan, but a number of developing countries are going to uh, face the problem of loan repayment and are you talking of uh, loan rescheduling or loan write-off? That is the going to be a key uh, question. And inequality in the international system is going to increase because of uh, this factor. So these are the kind of challenges that, you know, Pakistani state will have to face and for that matter, many you know, uh, developing countries. Final point, let me mention about Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, the, the economic inter, uh, interaction between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And every day, thousands of people used to move across Pakistan, Afghan border in both directions for a number of uh, reasons. All that has you know, uh, stopped. And this has also created a kind of economic problems for those who were engaged in this kind of trade or movement of people. Uh, for example, number of people would come to Peshawar city for medical uh, treatment. That's not possible. Sim Iran's connections with Balochistan uh, for economic uh, connections and trade, that has also been stopped and that also has negative implications. So I think Pakistan faces a very difficult economic uh, situation in the, in the future uh, yeah, after getting rid of uh, this coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Iskari. That's uh, very helpful. I was particularly interested in your observation that what Pakistan sees now uh, very clearly is that national security involves more than simply mil military preparedness. Uh, and yeah. I think that that's, that's a rather key point that we have. And it's, of course, not just the case for, by any means, for Pakistan. Yeah, that's We'll good. go on now. And I'm very pleased now to turn to um, Dr. Hamid Elmiar, who is public health specialist, an MD, and a former community health advisor in Afghanistan. Hamid, please. Hamid, we don't hear your vi video. Or your audio, rather. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you now. Okay, thank you. Sorry that I muted myself. Um, thank you, Marvin, for having me. First of all, hi to you, to uh, the fellow panelists and our audience. Uh, well, this COVID-19 is actually a concern. Um, this concern brings everyday life to a st standstill actually across the nations. Uh, and um, still amazing people like yourself, Marvin, um, are here whose work is helping other people across the world, especially to understand the scope of the pandemic, especially when it comes to the uh, underserved and poor countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan. 
So I thank you for that. Um, let me also thank all the first responders across the world uh, that are working hard uh, from nurses to physicians and other uh, people who are supplying food and everything in between. So the pandemic has actually affected more than 200 countries um, and territories globally. That um, is actually the number of global confirmed cases um, is, is increasing. It's actually exceeding 3 million people now. And uh, the novel coronavirus, um, coronavirus has actually uh, un caused uh, unprecedented challenges, um, not only in the uh, developing world, but also in uh, most developed world countries. Um, so it's the, the situation is actually rapidly evolving. And um, this is actually putting a, a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, although most nations in the world are suffering from the uh, pandemic, uh, but some more than others, um, yet the curve is actually moving and it's different countries are at different stages um, and different parts of the, of the, uh, of the curve, if, uh, so to speak. Um, and then the curve is actually, you know, uh, some places are well, hopefully uh, getting to flatten the curve and some places are trying to reopen the, the, uh, the businesses. I'm speaking of uh, countries across the world, but, um, this time is really a tough time um, because of the there is not any medications proved uh, to be effective and there is no vaccine available that escalates the uncertainty among the nations across the world and um, uncertainty takes a toll on, on nations on people uh, especially in the developing world uh, so uh, this is uh, a little tougher and and difficult um, to manage the epidemic in Afghanistan. And it's complicated due to various factors, such as the uh, fragile healthcare system in Afghanistan, health literacy, illiteracy and conflict, um, security issues, socioeconomic challenges. Um, in addition, the influx of the refugees, Afghan refugees from neighboring Iran and Pakistan has added actually to the problem. So if I ask this question that which age group is affected by more, uh, more by coronavirus, I'm pretty sure that the audience and, um, and the fellow panelists would agree that that is the elderly people. And why is that? Because their immune system is not uh, as strong and um, they may also have, you know, uh, some um, underlying diseases and, and uh, problems. So that is, uh, exactly similar when it comes to the low insurers, low um, um, income countries like Afghanistan, which are in conflict as well. They are um, security wise compromised. They are economically compromised uh, and uh, their health system is complicated. So this puts Afghanistan at the, at the more tougher situation than than the rest of of the world. Of course, there are other countries, and as my uh, fellow panelists were talking about Pakistan, uh, they may have you know the same issues. And the um, although the majority of the population of Afghanistan is young, but because of the uh, aforementioned uh, reasons, it's it's actually the whole nation is at the higher risk and vulnerability. So I'm going to share a couple slides with you guys, um, and um, this is the actually the current situation that how uh, Afghanistan is in terms of numbers. Uh, please let me know if the uh, if you can see mm -hmm. the screen. So there's a screen there, I guess. Okay, we have it. Okay, so this is actually the current situation. I, um, but before this, like, you know, uh, this, these numbers, I um, just wanted to give you a brief information about how and when the index case or the first case actually started in Afghanistan. That was the 24th of February, which we had only one case of the uh, coronavirus. And again, as um, in Pakistan, the same thing in Afghanistan, this was uh, imported case like uh, that um, uh, immigrant, actually refugee came back from, from Iran uh, in Herat, Afghanistan. 
and um, and then the the number actually increased um, because of the you know problems within uh, within Iran. Uh, most of these people either they were there for uh, for uh, pilgrim, pilgr they were either pilgrims or they were unemployed people who were working there. They returned back to Afghanistan, um, and the number in increased day by day, um, up to hundreds and thousands uh, of people. And um, with the recent data, I guess like there are more than 150,000 people um, who returned recently uh, back there. So, so imagine that if these people are all spread across the country. Um, how would that be very, um, that is really um, concerning. And, um, you know, tracing is not as easy in, in countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, tra uh, I mean, uh, contact tracing. And um, that puts the country in a difficult situation. Um, also, um, the number actually increased, uh, that was slower in, in terms of uh, confirmed cases because at the very beginning we didn't have uh, the testing capability um, even in, in Herat which was the the epicenter at the beginning we only had a few in Afghanistan uh, sorry in Kabul uh, but then it, the number has increased uh, we have testing centers back in uh, Herat and um, so with the more testings we know that there's uh, there's actually more people who are infected and uh, and again, this is this is probably um, not even showing the the exact number uh, of of people who are infected. Um, I I jumped actually already to the um, to the to the slide here that I wanted to show the magnitude of this problem here um, in in countries like Afghanistan. Um, so this is the current situation uh, as of uh, April 30th that we are speaking today. Uh, the number of samples collected were 9,800 and um, confirmed cases were 2,067 uh, and the um, total active cases were 1,748. The total recovery is 256 and the total death is 63. Um, so one thing that is really concerning if you ask me like what is the only one thing that keeps me awake at night is is actually the concerning situation that comes from uh, Afghanistan and, and countries like you know Afghanistan, uh, that the um, we don't have really all the all the facilities, the equipments, and the tools. Uh, but then the 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 uh, situation is evolving rapidly. I was actually working to get this data, and as I was working, like it took me because I needed to do something else, and then in between, like an, a couple hours or so. And uh, I saw that the number when I uh, when I updated and looked back at the uh, Ministry of Public Health uh, uh, report, it was 61 the number of deaths, and it's 63. As we are speaking now, it is actually 64. So just guess in in the number of hours that I was working on this, uh, the 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 death um, is actually is is increasing as well as the um, confirmed cases. The confirmed cases actually. It is a good thing and it's a, it's a bad thing too. Like the good thing is because we know that how many people are infected so we can isolate them and, and uh, also do the uh, contact tracing. Um, but, um, but again, the number of death is really um, concerning. And unfortunately, um, so far less than two months, um, I mean, the number of when the number of deaths actually, uh, I'm speaking about the, them, like seven physicians have died fighting with the coronavirus. That is something that Afghanistan cannot afford um, to, because of the lack of, you know, of the healthcare workers. If we lose them, that will be a disaster for the country. And um, this is, and again, most of the, the reason be behind that is because of the lack of uh, adequate PPEs and, and other um, tools that we need. Um, this is, let me share the other slide here. Um, so that's, uh, and speaking of the, before this slide, I, I forgot to mention in this uh, first slide that as I was calculating with myself, like this is the number of deaths and 63 and the number of total of cases 2000 almost. Um, if you take the percentage, it is uh, like 
3% date uh, the mortality rate, which is again high. Um, and uh, comparing to some other countries, um, I don't know how is it in, in Pakistan in terms of uh, um, the, the mortality rate. But this other slide here um, is breaking down uh, the number of uh, confirmed cases as well as the deaths uh, in in different provinces in Afghanistan. Um, as again, you see the Kabul is the epicenter now. Uh, the number of confirmed cases in, in uh, Kabul is 553 and uh, the death is uh, 14 people. And I guess, again, this is 15 now because just one more added uh, like a couple of minutes ago. Um, then Herat is the second after Kabul. Uh, number of confirmed cases is 500, 475 and the death is 12. And Kandahar is the third with a number of 279 confirmed cases and seven deaths. And then Balhor Mazar Sharif is actually the fourth uh, with eight people died there and um, 169 people were confirmed. Uh, and again, the list goes on and this is uh, for almost the entire um, nation or the provinces are actually infected um, somehow with, with different numbers. Um, and this other slide here is actually breaking down the, um, the number of uh, hospitalizations and uh, based on the age. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, Afghanistan is a, um, uh, like the population is a, more than 60% is, uh, is young, younger generation and uh, between uh, 20 and 39 is showing also here that the more affected people are also this age group. Uh, uh, as you can see here, um, 20 to 29 years of age, the number of cases is 508 and that makes uh, the number of uh, hospitalization is 197. 28% of the hospitalization is actually the age of 20 to 29. And uh, the age of 30 to 39 is um, the number of uh, cases is 468. That is the second highest and 26%, which is uh, the hospitalization number again is 150. Um, again, if you see at the, at the graph here, at this chart, it is basically the youth people and um, there's again a good thing and a bad thing about this part here. The good thing is that these younger generations, um, uh, I mean, the, the, the youth, they have uh, stronger immune systems so they can fight the, the uh, coronavirus. Um, but, but again, it could be also, um, the bad thing is maybe because the, uh, the younger generations don't take it that serious and that is a little concerning if they are, if not taking it serious, you know, they're either um, not practicing social distancing or whatever it is, the, the causes and the reasons. Um, that is putting them at risk. Um, and um, you can see that, that the older generation, like uh, 50 to 59 is 12% uh, of the hospitalization and then um, 71 and 80 plus is uh, just 2% of the hospitalizations. Um, again, as I was just talking about uh, earlier about the healthcare workers, this is a major concern. Um, the number of healthcare workers uh, who are infected is, is really um, high in, in Herat. That shows the 62 people. And then it's in Kandahar, 35 people. And then Kabul uh, and uh, Kunduz are the same 18 uh, people who were infected. There, as you can see in that chart, there are other people, uh, healthcare workers across the country uh, who are infected. Uh, again, I want to say that this is mostly because of the um, uh, lack of uh, PPEs and uh, it could be also the reason because it is new not only for Afghanistan, coronavirus is new for the rest of the world, uh, that people were not prepared and that's, we do need, uh, you know, to prepare the, even the healthcare providers to be, uh, to have crash courses and stuff to get ready for, uh, for the uh, epidemic in, in those countries in this pandemic. Well, um, back to you, Marvin, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Hami. I, I thank you very much for, again, another comprehensive picture, uh, in this case of Afghanistan. And uh, lastly, uh, 
Uh, I take uh, great pleasure in welcoming uh, Vander Feldbaum Brown. Uh, Vander is a senior fellow at the Center for Century Security and Intelligence at the Brookings Institution. She's a senior advisor to the congressionally mandated Afghanistan Peace Process Study Group. Vanda, please. Well, thank you. As uh, Hamid pointed out, um, for the pandemic to hit Afghanistan, inevitable as it was because of uh, the regional movement of people, uh, just compounds the already extraordinary storm and enormously precarious situation that Afghanistan is going through. Uh, under the best of circumstances, uh, perhaps 55% of the population lives in poverty. Many people live without any kind of access to medical care, um, other support system, but that they are in rural areas, but also in urban areas, many of which uh, have um, not what we would call slums, perhaps, but uh, severely um, underprovided um, places. And that's, of course, a country in war where uh, the violence has already been intensifying. So there is every expectation to be had that both the mortality uh, of the illness will be very high, as will be uh, the extent, the length by which it takes place. And indeed, I think this is something that uh, needs to be understood and needs to be thought about, uh, unlike in the West, where uh, the ability to isolate and self-isolate and social distance um, is far more feasible for people. This is not the case in, for the majority of people in Afghanistan who simply need to go out every day to uh, earn money to feed their family and themselves, who do not have the capacity to stay out of work for any substantial period of time, who do not have electricity, who do not have refrigeration, who cannot stock up um, on food supplies. And so one of the likely implications, of course, is that um, we will not uh, see the containment of the illness in the same way that the severe lockdowns were able to achieve in the West. And uh, that there is a very high chance that uh, the illness will simply continue re-emerging and re-emerging and then we'll see wave after wave after wave of infection persisting um, in the population. Uh, already uh, with the lockdown, uh, nonetheless, with border uh, being shut down, we have seen a severe economic downturn in Afghanistan, a country that's already uh, economically and the margins dependent uh, on both foreign aid and um, uh, the drug economy, and that has seen a more or less continual decline of economic income over the past um, uh, five years, particularly very dramatic decline of economic revenue generation uh, since 2014. So between uh, the previous month and this month, we have seen about 95% of decline in the customs, customs being one of the largest sources of revenue for the government, and about 30% of decline in taxes. Um, much more uh, of that economic um, um, difficulty is yet likely to come. What we, however, have not seen, unfortunately, is any kind of reduction in violence. In fact, despite uh, uh, calls uh, by the international community and by the Afghan government that the Taliban um, uh, has at least a temporary ceasefire, the Taliban has refused to do so. The issue of the ceasefire is also one of the big stumbling blocks in getting negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban going. Uh, the Taliban has uh, taken uh, an interesting attitude toward COVID, uh, unlike in the case of polio, where it has prevented uh, both Afghan and international healthcare workers from um, uh, reaching particular areas, believing both or, uh, that uh, polio is meant to sterilize Muslim women, uh, the polio vaccine that is, and uh, also believing that um, medical doctors will be complicit in providing intelligence on uh, Taliban members. In the case of COVID, uh, the Taliban has repeatedly said that they welcome uh, international and uh, Afghan medical communities, has tried to some extent to coordinate with the Afghan government. It has also launched campaigns to teach people how to have better hygiene, how to uh, wash their hands, and unlike in Pakistan, where many mullahs have been urging uh, for people to go to mosques despite uh, the lockdown, despite the directives from the medical community, the Taliban has not been doing that. In fact, it has said several times that um, although COVID is an act of Allah, it, is, uh, it affects not only infidels, 
Uh, it also aff affects Muslim populations and that people should pray at home. Um, and it's been trying to teach issues such as um, social distancing. Um, recently, uh, the Taliban gave a, a press conference where it invited journalists. And uh, at the conference, it sort of uh, showed what uh, first place appeared as a temperature thermometer, as a, as, a, as a temperature gun. And it, of course, turned out to be just a wooden mock-up wrapped in white gauze. And I think this is of the limitations that, of, that the Taliban has in presenting itself as a governing authority. It can uh, start violence. Uh, it, is, uh, it excels in providing um, Sharia justice and dealing with dispute resolution. It excels in reducing all kinds of predatory rapacious activity uh, and uh, providing order, a brutal order, but order nonetheless. But it is extremely limited in what kind of actual service delivery it can do and really needs to rely on external help. Uh, so it is dependent on the international community to be reaching populations uh, or international uh, or uh, Afghan medical community to be uh, reaching populations. Uh, but meanwhile, the war proceeds uh, at an extraordinarily fast pace. The spring offensive has kicked into gear and there is no indication that the summer and uh, the rest of the spring uh, will be any milder than they are already with the Taliban killing between 20 and 40 members of the Afghan security forces daily. Perhaps uh, the death rates for the Taliban are similar, we don't know, but the pounding that the Afghan security forces are taking uh, is very high. And so one of the questions for both sides, for both the uh, uh, Taliban and uh, the uh, Afghan security forces is whether one side is more vulnerable to infection spreading among rank and file, with what ease they can replenish uh, uh, soldiers who fall ill, uh, how that will spread. Uh, we don't know that yet, but it's one of the big issues of how that will affect the battlefield. And the second issue is to the extent that um, the infections uh, start spreading through Taliban leadership ranks, middle level commanders and higher, how is that going to change the willingness uh, or unwillingness of the Taliban to negotiate a peace deal? If many of the older leaders fall ill to COVID and perhaps die, uh, will middle younger commanders be more belligerent or will they be more accommodating? Unfortunately, I would say they are likely to be more belligerent and less accommodating. But that's yet to be seen. And I would posit that it's also uh, an issue for uh, the Afghan political scene, where many of the key politicians, of course, are of advanced age. And consequently, uh, if they uh, contract COVID, uh, they uh, are highly susceptible to um, uh, struggling with the illness. Underlying or, or coexisting with all of this is uh, very significant um, actions by the US government uh, and um, uh, really radical changes in the political order uh, in Afghanistan with respect to US role. The United States is out of its way uh, from Afghanistan on 29th of February. It signed a deal with the Taliban uh, in which the United States was promised to withdraw all of its forces by July 2021 in exchange for the Taliban not attacking US targets and allied targets and not allowing uh, Afghan territory to be used for such purposes for other terrorist groups. Uh, US withdrawal has proceeded uh, at the rapid pace and potentially is intensifying. It is likely we see some information that the withdrawal of US forces is intensifying. And certainly President Trump is enormously determined to maximize the rate of withdrawal and has repeatedly complained why US troops are still in Afghanistan and particularly while they are there during COVID and vulnerable to COVID. And President Trump very much wishes that despite the deal that was signed, all US troops would be out of Afghanistan by um, the US November elections. Meanwhile, however, the uh, persisting dispute between uh, President Ashraf Ghani and uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, prominent politician who challenged him in the government, uh, goes on with both claiming they are the true uh, president of Afghanistan that creates uh, many difficulties in the negotiations uh, in the country, but more importantly, has resulted in the US cutting of 1 billion of uh, its aid to Afghanistan. 
although not all of these cuts have been practiced yet been implemented because there are uh, actual difficulties in implementing the cuts, they are nonetheless there. And uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo has also threatened another billion cut for next year. This is an enormous loss for Afghanistan. Enormous loss that Afghanistan has no capacity to recover. Um, essentially, 500 million uh, of US aid goes to support of the civilian uh, Afghan government administration and the, the rest goes to the military. The U uh, Afghan military is almost solely supported by the United States at the rate of about $4 billion a year. One point billion cuts, two billion cuts are not recoverable for the government and will have catastrophic impact on the Afghan military. It is critical that uh, the continuing dispute is resolved so US aid can be uh, restored. Uh, otherwise, the very capacity of the Afghan government uh, to function both militarily and otherwise is severely jeopardized. President Ghani has hoped uh, that he would uh, be able to uh, obtain um, uh, aid from uh, uh, the Gulf, uh, from Saudi Arabia and other Sunni countries. Uh, particularly uh, uh, taking advantage of the dispute between Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, pointing out that the Taliban is being ho hosted by Qatar. I am deeply skeptical that um, he would in fact be able to uh, bring aid uh, on the order to compensate for the losses of um, US, the US cutting uh, $2 billion of aid. All of which points to um, an extremely difficult year, months uh, ahead in Afghanistan with massive food insecurity looming, far greater number of people in poverty, persisting uh, disease in the country and very intense violence. And, and intense violence um, and uh, economic decline is even something that the Taliban is um, concerned about. It's particularly concerned about the cutoff of economic aid to Afghanistan as much as it hopes that it will come to power because it understands that it cannot uh, compensate uh, for those losses. And it does not want to see the decline of the country as we have seen uh, in the 1990s. Let me... Um, leave it here for the moment and I'm glad to entertain some of the questions. I, I should say, I will make just one more comment. Uh, the numbers that we have heard from Hamid and Natasha, and I welcome both to join me. Um, I imagine particularly in Afghanistan are a very severe um, undercount of the actual spread of the illness. I mean, I routinely hear that the actual numbers are more than 10 times higher than what the official numbers are. Um, you know, I welcome your thoughts about uh, those estimates. I, I totally agree with that. Um. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Venda. Uh, as you can see, our time has uh, run out, but I do have the option here of extending it somewhat in order to entertain some questions that have, well, actually, we have far more questions than we could possibly entertain. Uh, also, I, I think some of the people who have posed the questions uh, would agree with me that we have, uh, we have answered them, if not specifically, we have done so, I think, sufficiently that uh, uh, they should feel satisfied that they have better understanding uh, based on uh, what they've heard relative to their questions. So uh, let me, uh, with, uh, with the leave of the panelists to, to uh, leave some t extra time now to pose some questions. One question that has been certainly one issue that has not been uh, <clears throat> at this point covered, and that is uh, domestic violence and women's rights. Uh, I think that there, is a good, there are a good many people who wonder, is there any consequences here uh, in this situation? where those are going to be affected. So uh, whoever would like to jump in, please. Well, Margaret, let me come in on that. What uh, we have seen around the world, from United States to Italy, from Switzerland to Mexico, is very significant jump in domestic violence as a result of um, lockdowns. The fact that victims um, do not have the capacity to go to public places, they are left in the household with the abuser on a constant basis. Uh, I 
imagine that is very much the situation in Afghanistan and Pakistan as well, perhaps with the difference that for many rural women in Afghanistan, uh, their access uh, to the public space, their ability to leave the household uh, is already fully dependent on the man, whether it's the husband or the father uh, or the male relative. So they may, they exist often uh, amidst um, uh, very severe abuse. Uh, some 90% uh, of Afghan women report they faced physical abuse. That's an enormous number, 90%. Uh, and that's not just in the rural spaces. Um, so uh, I would imagine that uh, for urban women, the situation probably got worse. For rural women, the situation continued to be very poor. But one I mentioned uh, that I would like to raise here is um, Afghanistan, like uh, Iran, like other countries, has emptied some of its prisons. And of course, uh, many women in Afghanistan are uh, imprisoned on the basis of so-called moral crimes, whether this is uh, sex outside of marriage or um, uh, some effort to defend themselves against the physical and mental abuse they face from male relatives. And those women, in my view, should never have been um, uh, imprisoned in the first place, even though Afghan laws um, do um, result in their being imprisoned. Nonetheless, the question is what happens with them when they are released from prison. The doors are simply open, but there really has been no systematic effort to provide any kind of shelter uh, for those women who cannot return to their communities, both because they escaped the household, the community in the first place, and because they would very likely be killed uh, um, if, uh, or faced other severe abuse if they attempted to return. So along with refugees who are being hit very badly, who uh, in many refugee camps, there, there, uh, uh, there is no uh, access anymore by either Afghan or international aid providers. So refugee camps are now going on for days without food, without water, uh, without any kind of other support. Uh, really very bad situation that is not getting much coverage. Um, I would imagine that some of the prisoners, particularly women who were released, are probably in a dire situation. Thank you. Does anybody else want to quickly Yes, uh, yeah, this is Askari. I can, I can you know, make a few please, comments. Please. Uh, there's no um, you know, data available to suggest that domestic violence has increased in Pakistan because of uh, this uh, lockdown. Uh, the violence that we fear is of the other kind uh, because uh, uh, initially the lockdown was uh, very strict now uh, it has become kind of a loose uh, lockdown or what the government calls it smart lockdown and um, that is the you know small business people shopkeepers traders you know getting uh, very much upset and in certain areas they try to open their shops in violation of government order the fear is that if these restrictions continue uh, then perhaps some of them would be willing uh, to contest or fight the police or security personnel that are um, uh, there to stop them from doing. So that kind of violence can take place, but uh, domestic violence, at least the media has not received uh, so much information to suggest that uh, violence, uh, domestic violence has increased in the last two months. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Um, we have also, while I have you on the screen, uh, Askari, uh, perhaps you want to address this as well. Uh, you can't really talk about Pakistan without somebody bringing up civilian military relations. Uh, is there any yes. reason to believe that that in any way is impacted by, uh, by these recent developments, health developments? Well, at the moment, the civil and military are working uh, together and military um, is very active in supporting different uh, ventures that are being uh, done for supplying you know, um, material to hospitals. For example, the, the products, uh, medical products that Pakistan is getting from China, they are transported from Islamabad uh, to different places uh, by the military in their own trucks. And military is also, involved in the uh, planning uh, of the strategy 
at the highest level in Islamabad. They are working with the civilian leadership and uh, they work together. So I think uh, for the time being, uh, the relations are very smooth, cooperative. I think both uh, realize that they need each other. A military alone uh, will not have access in this connection and civilians uh, administration is handicapped by weak organization and also lack of efficiency, which normally the bureaucracy has. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've so far only covered two of the many questions, but let me, let me go on just a little bit longer and ask uh, uh, Hamid and Natasha uh, if there is a possibility here that Pakistan and Afghanistan may dodge the bullet here, uh, that uh, they may very well uh, be fortunate for reasons that perhaps you would explain why they may very well not face such dire circumstances as many people would think, recognizing that certainly uh, if that does happen, it would be catastrophic. Please, uh, uh, Natasha. Thank you, Marvin. Um, so coming back to something that Vanda asked about the um, estimation of the total number of cases and are we underestimating it? The problem is that the only people that are coming out for testing are symptomatic people. So if you're feeling sick and you're, you're, you've got all the symptoms of COVID, then you're being pushed forward for a test. Um, and those are the cases that we're counting. So uh, we uh, have no idea how many asymptomatic cases there are. Um, and that, that's, that's one of the reasons why we're thinking that we were, we're under, underestimating how many people are really infected. Um, so with, with that, if we've got a lot of asymptomatic people, that means that people who are being exposed are not becoming as unwell as other countries. Um, I mean, it's a long shot. We don't know. We, we still have to do a lot of research in this. We still need to find out uh, what, what, what our immunity or our immune response looks like uh, to this virus. And I don't, we are planning to do these studies, but they haven't started yet. So we don't have any data on it. Um, but I think that that's, yeah. So I, I um, and our death rate right now is low, but people are saying that's because uh, your numbers haven't reached that point yet where you're going to get a higher death rate. Um, it seems as though even those people who are infected, the, the age groups that are infected, they're still getting very moderate, mild disease. Um, so I think um, we, we're waiting and watching. I mean, we, we, I mean, it's so difficult to predict either way. It's sort of like, you know, the devil in the deep blue sea. We don't know which way this is going to go. Um, either way, yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, we, we, we're sort of, we, we, need to, we need to have, we need to either be prepared or, or we need to, uh, you know, we need to sort of manage uh, as and when we do see this surge that we're expecting. Uh, Habib? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, with, uh, in line with what Natasha just mentioned is also the, the number um, that is actually reflected in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, the number of cases um, uh, confirmed or, or the death number is um, it's really hard to tell that that's the actually the, um, the the reality or the accurate number behind these, um, you know, because for for a number of reasons, um, partly it's because most people who are infected, we don't have actually uh, enough testing capability in Afghanistan, so that we can know how many people are infected. As I just mentioned earlier, like a huge number of um, of uh, refugees returned from Iran. If, if they all were spread across the country, um, I mean, even if 10% of those number of people were infected, guess how many people are infected, how many people they uh, already were in contact with. If it's on average, if each person saw another five people, at least in their own family or, or in the neighboring um, places that they went to, that increases a lot of the, um, you know, the, the number. And it's uh, another concern is that the, we don't have um, like, you know, when, when somebody dies, they, we don't have um, death certificates or anything that it's officially reported. Um, if people die at home or if the people um, even who are infected, this, this 
uh, there's a huge number maybe behind that that uh, cannot this this number is not um, actually showing the exact number um so for with that um, for in order to tackle these issues i think that we need to uh, increase the ca the capacity of testing in afghanistan we have to be very um, um you know rigorous on on contact tracing um as well as urging the uh, the um the the public to d practice social distancing and if they are staying at home like the quarantine time they have to stay at home and hand washing these basic things it is a crisis time in a crisis it's actually like the, the, those three steps that is actually um is practical now that um you know first of all you have to have the communication communication is key here especially when it comes to the developing world and then this um then you do the you know roles and responsibilities and then the third step would be the execution um speaking with the, with the first step especially when it comes to the developing world we don't have a we don't have the the facilities the tools and in the equipments and the technology to uh to tackle with this problem at, at the level where for example the us is doing or some other european or more developed nations are, are, are tackling the issue. So I would um, insist again and emphasize on the very first step, which is the communication. And it has to be very clear, public awareness and, and uh, public awareness and public awareness again. We have to do it either through, you know, through the social media, through the um, uh, main media channels and, and people, even with, if we talk to, I was born and raised in Afghanistan, like, I know the, the, how the traditionally people are uh, influenced. Uh, most of the people and 70% of the population are in uh, rural areas. If, uh, if we reach out to the um, people who are more influential in those communities, like the community elders, mm -hmm. and, and convince them to see the magnitude and the problem which this pandemic has caused, then they can easily pass it on to the to the rest of the community so that they can uh, take action and take it more serious. Um, I think that is the, the key that we should focus on. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really uh, have to be excused in the fact that I can't possibly get to all of these excellent questions, uh, but I do want to thank our panelists for uh, extending their time this morning, but also uh, for the excellent presentations that we've been able to uh, hear from them. Uh, and I want to thank the, again, the uh, viewers who have submitted these questions and who have stayed with us uh, through this time. And I hope this has been an, a morning in which uh, we'll all come away uh, certainly better informed about what's going on in Afghanistan with regard to this health crisis that we're all experiencing. So with that, let me, let me say uh, uh, good day uh, and all keep well, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Marvin.